Scripture passage I was given uh, is in Titus chapter 2. So if you turn with me to there. Titus chapter 2. And I'll be reading out of the NLT. Starting at verse 1, and that's the entire chapter. 
As for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and be pure to work in their homes, to do good and to be submissive to their husbands. This will, th then they will not bring shame on the word of God. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. And you yourselves must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so that your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose you will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. Slaves must always obey their master and do their best to please them. They must, talk, they must not talk back or steal, but must show themselves to be entirely trustworthy, trustworthy and good. Then they will make the, the teaching about God our Savior attractive in everywhere, every way. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn our godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in the we we should live in this evil wor world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God, while we look forward with hope at the wonderful day when the uh, glory of our God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave us His life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. You must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary, so don't let anyone dis disregard what you say. So far the reading of God's word. Pastor David. Thank you for that uh, good reading, Brian. That's wonderful. Uh, a sobering passage. Uh, sometimes it, this may seem a little bit like a little difficult to hear at first. But I hope that this, this sermon will be, um, will be encouraging and will bear you up. It will, it will strengthen what's already there and spur you on to what might be missing because there's grace there for you. God is a God of grace. Titus 2, and I titled this sermon, what the, Would the Real Church Please Stand Up? Would the Real Church Please Stand Up? Do you remember the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? You remember that one? In it, there's a scene at the very end and there's this knight, and he's guarding the Holy Grail. And this is the quest that Indiana Jones has been on to, to find this Holy Grail. And drinking from this cup it, in the story, it would, it would give you eternal youth and roll back the clock. That's the idea. And uh, the villain of the story wants it for evil purposes. And he, he grabs one of the cups. He's, which one could it be? Which one could it be? And he grabs the most beautiful golden uh, chalice with diamonds and rubies and dips into the and drinks and dies a horrible death and the knight says he is chosen badly and Indiana Jones he has to save his father he's not in this to do he's good right Indiana Jones is our hero and he looks and he's got to figure out what would the Holy Grail be and it's good Plenty of cups, all laid out, different kinds. And he looks down, and he grabs this wooden cup, just a plain wooden cup, nicely carved, and dips and drinks, and he doesn't die. And the knight says to him, you have chosen wisely. This picture is an excellent picture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, now and throughout history. Because sometimes the largest and grandest buildings 
held church services that had nothing to do with the gospel. Nothing. Like fluff and wind. Nothing to do with the Bible. And nothing to do with Jesus Christ at all. Some churches have all the things to attract people to them. Come on in. We've got dimmed lights. Come on in. We have fog machines. Come on in. We have lasers. I've seen churches like this. Come on in. We'll play all the pop music you want to hear. And make it like a rock concert for you. Because we know you love rock concerts. And some have candies and mugs and goodie bags and gift bags and coupons to save money on Al's tire emporium down the street. You know, all these things to attract the people of the world. Do we remember what Jesus said, though? Luke 19, 46. When he came to the temple, he said this. It is written... My house shall be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. He was not impressed. You remember what he did then? He was angry. He flipped the tables. We know Jesus is full of grace and full of truth. And he is kind. He didn't come to quench the burning wick. He didn't come to break the, the, boat, the bruised reed. But take this to heart. He's very serious about the house of God. He's very serious about the honor of his father. Take that to heart. So what does the real church look like? Is it a carnival? Is it a circus? Is it anything goes? What does the real church look like? So I want to ask, could the real church please stand up? (laughs) I thought I didn't know if that would happen or not. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, I kind of wondered if that would happen. But that wasn't my point. Please join me in prayer for God's help in understanding his word. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, I pray that you would please bring to light your word and make it clear. Make it clear to us, Lord. Your word is powerful, able to divide even soul and spirit. Let it not return void. Let it reach our hearts. And help me, help me, Lord, to teach your word in Jesus' name, your holy name. Amen. So if you haven't already, please open your Bibles to Titus 2, and the verses are 1 to 15. 1 to 15 in Titus 2. This is a background of the structure of this book. I just want to let you know, it's a, Paul is speaking to Titus. Well, who's Titus, and where is he, and what's going on in the He's talking to Titus. Titus is on an island. It's a big island in the middle of the Mediterranean. And it's, if you go and you look in the Mediterranean, you go to Italy on the map, and you go to the right, you'll, you'll hit this massive island called Crete. Um, Titus is what Paul describes as my true child in the common faith. You see, Titus had come to faith listening to Paul. And Paul had invested in Titus for years, building him up, helping him, discipling him. He considers him like his own child. The book of Titus is a pastoral letter. It's an epistle. It's describing Titus' work, his role there, who the people were, what Crete was like, what the church is meant to be and what they, were, what they were becoming. It's a picture, really. If you look at it, it's just like a snapshot in time of 
what the church should be, what God's desire is for the church. There are four main points in my sermon here. First, I'll list them for you. Number one, what the church is not supposed to be. Number two, Christ's desire for his church. Number three, what is the real church supposed to look like? And number four, the real church has pastors who are sound in teaching. Number one, what the church is not supposed to be. Titus 1.12 says this, One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Is there any other better word to describe a foul person than a cretin? It just seems so bad. Maybe you've heard it before in, in some expressions. Well, it comes from this verse right here. Cretin. You're a cretin. They were abysmal people. On this island, this insulated island, they were lying and cheating and stealing and carrying on in all kinds of evil things until Paul arrived with the gospel. We forget how bad it can be without the gospel, don't we? It was an island of darkness. The world and the cretins, when they hear the gospel, they're convicted of their sin and they turn and repent and turn to Christ and they begin to walk in the light, the light of the Lord. These cretins were becoming saints in Jesus Christ. They were being called out of their worldly passions and evil ways and turning and becoming his church. It says that they were cheaters and liars. Certainly the church should not be cheating and the church should not be lying. In Titus 1.12 it says they were liars, evil beasts, and gluttons. We can assume that they were lying whenever it suited them. It was a way of life. Maybe you've known someone like that. And you just know they're not going to be truthful. If it suits them, they're just going to lie to your face. And you just, you pick up on that. That's what these people were like. And it says they were cheating. Cheating probably in business dealings. Lying and cheating should have, you shouldn't even have a hint of that in the church. This is what the church should not be. The church should not be cheating in business. Completely above board. Not even a hint of misappropriation of money. Should even a whiff of it should come from this place. The church is not to have lying and cheating, just as the cretins were doing. And they were lazy, it says. They were gluttons. Laziness is not a good quality to have. And it's really not a good quality because it's actually a sin before the Lord. If you're unwilling to work, 2 Thessalonians 3 states this, you won't eat. You want to know what God thinks about work? It's not me talking. You won't work, you won't eat. Simple as that. What does that say about our welfare state in Canada today? What does that say? Has that got any Christian value in it at all? No, it's not. If you won't work, you're not supposed to eat. That's how God thinks of laziness. The church is not to be lazy. There's not to be 10 people doing the work in the church and 90 people warming the pews. It's not. And I've seen that. I've been in churches for, you know, I'm 51, saved in my 20s. I've seen it. Sometimes, most of the work is done by a handful of people. And that's not supposed to be the church. It also says that the Cretans were insubordinate. They had become Christians, but they were still carrying on in their old ways. Titus 1.10 says that the Christians in Crete were insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. That's pretty heavy-handed. Those were people in the church in Crete. The word insubordinate here comes from a Greek word which has three parts to it. An upo taktoi. So upo means, hupo means hypodermic, under, right? And taktoi means to arrange things that are totally chaotic and disorganized. Put them in line and put them in order and get things set. 
And the word an is a negation. Like atheist is not a theist. These people would not allow themselves to be brought under and organized. Like herding cats. You ever tried to do that? Herding cats doesn't work very well. You just, I told you to stay here. That's what these, they were insubordinate. That's what it says. The real church is not supposed to be insubordinate. Hebrews 13, 17 says this, Obey your leaders. Obey them. Submit to your leaders. For they watch over your souls. Do you not know that the elders in this church and myself will have to give an account before Almighty God for our behavior day by day in taking care of this church. God has placed that on them. So that's being insubordinate, being lazy, being idle, being lying and cheating, and having these qualities is not supposed to be the church. What is Christ's desire for the church? Main point number two. What is Christ's desire for the church? Three things I see here. Redeeming them. Purifying them. That they would do good works. It says he wants to redeem us. It's his desire. Jesus had a passion. He had a passion. It said... He set his face towards Jerusalem to go to the cross. He had a passion to go to the cross for you and for me. It's his desire to redeem us. He's paying the penalty on that cross for all of our sin. He's buying us back. That's what the word redeem means. Redeem, redemption. There's no forgiveness of sin no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. Your sin will never be washed away without that blood of Christ. To remit is to take an invoice and pay it and slide it over. It's done. Nothing is owed now. And without his precious blood, we would all be standing under the wrath of God. It says we should be purified. He wants to purify us. Verse 14. We're no longer to continue in the ways that we had. You can't just go on living as any, doing anything you want. Those who have truly received salvation in Jesus Christ will have this understanding of their sin. That they shouldn't try to continue in it wantonly, without any care anymore. We're not perfect. And I'm not trying to say that we are. Please don't misunderstand me. I don't want to lay a burden of heavy guilt on someone who is feeling excessively guilty. There is now no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ. But because of what he's done for you, this passage, 11 to 15, states, because of what he's done for you, live like this. Live in this good way for him. Out of thanksgiving, out of a heart of love for what he's done. He wants us to be purified. Ephesians 5.27 says this. His desire is that his church would be a pure and spotless bride. If we are meant to be the bride of Christ, then think and consider for a second what should the church look like. And the first thing that comes to mind is not lasers and smoke and fog machines. Okay? That's the first thing that doesn't come to mind. No, the first thing that should come to mind is doing good. That's what Jesus wants for his church. Doing good. Not just doing good like, yeah, all right, I'll take part. Why don't I do a little good? No. What does it say in verse 14? Zealous. We get that word zealot. A religious zealot. Well, you should be a good works zealot. You should. That's what he wants for you. Instead of doing this, he saved you out of it that you would do good works. And it says in Ephesians 2, verse 10, the believers in Christ are created by him for good works. 
And get this, God prepared beforehand those good works that you might walk in them. Not only did he save you, but he's prepared works in advance he wants you to walk in. And that's going to be joyful for you and bring glory to him. So do we see that we are meant for more than just sitting in a pew? We are meant to be giving glory to the Lord. In good works, in our behavior, we are to be the fragrance of Christ, it says in Corinthians. Main point number three, what is the real church supposed to look like then? What is the real church supposed to look like? If that's Christ's desire, we look back and we say, Titus 2, what is the church supposed to look like? It says, in everything that you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. That's in verse 10, the end of verse 10. You may adorn. In everything you may adorn. That means that you would adorn it. You would decorate the doctrine. This message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you would bring some sort of beautification to it. Your life will show the gospel. It won't degrade the gospel. So we see here a picture of the church. We see here a picture of what God wants for his church. We're not perfect, but this is what we should be striving for. Old men, it says, to be sober-minded, dignified, and self-controlled. And this can also be translated as somber, reverent, and temperate. And these, these, these qualities are, again, an overview. This is not, we're not, you know, very specific. This is, you know, we do all this and then we're fine. There's other passages which describe the church. But let's hear these things and let them hit us. It says of the older men, they should be sound in faith, in their love, and in their steadfastness. The word sound here, if Jake Reamer was here, he could tell you he's a concrete guy. It's like sounding. Sounding is finding empty spots, pits, fissures, cracks, problems in a material. When you sound out concrete, you're looking for bubbles in there and the, that are going to weaken that structure. Sounding out makes you know for sure that is, a, that is it's whole, it's full, complete, and it's healthy. And that's how this, this word uh, that, that we use for sound in the Greek is kind of like the word hygiene. Yugianontas. Hyugeion. It's like hygiene. That's where we get it. Hygiene. It's like being whole. It's like being healthy. Make sure your, your faith and your love and your patience is whole and healthy. You're not lacking in this in any way. That's what the striving we're striving toward. That's what the church should look like. So we can ask ourselves, we can ask, old men can ask ourselves, am I dignified? Am I self-controlled? Is my faith, love, and patience sound? The older women, it says, are to likewise. Notice the verse says likewise. It means very similar. It's a complementing type of thing. Older women and older men and they come together and they complement one another. Right? There's the same things here. It should be reverent and somber and temperate. And the scriptures speak here very clearly about two things that the women, the older women, should think carefully on. They should watch. And that is slander and drinking too much wine. And this was a problem. It's a problem then, and I would say it's always been a problem, right? The word for slander is diabolos. It's like diabolical. There is one who slanders us before the throne of God, right? The accuser. Don't join in the accuser by slandering your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't join him. And it says about the wine, it doesn't say that you must be, you know, you don't have, can never have a glass of wine. 
No, it doesn't say that. It says, do not be enslaved to it. That's the word, enslaved. You see, alcohol is seductive and it's destructive. If you're turning to alcohol rather than to the Lord as a relief, you're going to get into a bad situation where you depend on it. And you're going to be given over to it more and more. Because that drink is a seductive thing. And I've struggled with alcohol in my life before I was saved. I'm speaking from experience. So the older women can ask themselves, am I careful with my words? What are the words coming out of my mouth? Do my words, as the Bible says, impart grace to the hearer? And what is the hold that alcohol has over me? And I don't know who I'm speaking to here, but consider this carefully. The younger women, it says that uh, the older women are to teach them. The older women to teach the younger women. And we have this beautiful model here of discipleship. Discipleship. It's personal and it's intimate. Discipleship, I believe, is best one-to-one. -one. You look the other person in the face and you're able to tell them what's going on. And they're able to tell you what they think you should do and share with you. And that's what they're doing with the old women and with the, with the younger women. They're sharing with them and they're teaching them. We need to be taught. The Lord's designed it that way, that we be in community, we be in relationship, and we have discipleship. The old men also. This is a likewise situation. Likewise. It says that the young women should love their husbands, love their children, submit to their husbands. I just want to touch on that carefully and say that in no way does God expect you to submit to abuse. Never. Verbal or physical abuse is not what you're called to submit to. The husband is called to love his wife as Christ loved the church with a sacrificial love, a nurturing love, a cherishing love. So we're to strive for these things. We're not perfect. We're to strive for them. And it says also homemakers. And isn't that sort of a dirty word in today's culture for a woman to be a homemaker? I happen to think that the greatest job in the world is raising children. The greatest job in the world. That's the next generation. What greater job could you have? What did I do for a living? Designing machines that put macaroni in boxes. Shampoo in bottles. How does that compare to a woman raising the next generation of children? The next generation of society hangs in the balance. A homemaker, it says here, is, the word is really interesting. It means the engine of the home. The one who makes the home work. The one who, if she wasn't there, then the lights would be off and nothing would ever happen. She's the one making the family happen in the background. It's an incredible role. The home maker. She's the driving force. So a younger woman should ask themselves, do I value homemaking? God values it. He does because he loves families. And he knows what makes a family work best. Consider what the world is telling you about homemaking and what the Lord is telling you here about homemaking and how he values it. In younger men it says, likewise. Again, right? Likewise. This is for all of us. So just like the younger women are given a load of instructions, and the guys seem to be getting off scot-free here with the self-control little snippet at the end, it says likewise. So it means in the same way. Young men, listen to the old men. Learn from them. Model their, their, their behavior their speech. Look forward to them. That's wise living. Look to them. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. That's a heavy weight to, for the older men to try and to do that, but God's asking you to be that, that model. 
And young men, it says exhibit self-control. Self-control. That means you don't sit around in your home and just twiddle your thumbs and I'm not doing anything, so I can't be doing anything wrong. It means going through life, avoiding ungodly passions, wickedness, that tempts you or wants to pull you in, showing self-control and restraint in some of these things. But also knowing that in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18 it says this, God has given us freely all things to enjoy. You like snowmobiling? Great! But don't let it control your life. You like playing baseball? Great! But don't let it control your life. Serve the Lord, rather, and serve Him in it. Be a light for the Lord on your baseball team. Self-control. So, young men, are you putting aside worldly passions? It's hard. It is hard. Especially when you've got all that fire in your belly when you're young. Channel it. Moses, it says, was a meek man. Meek. But meek didn't mean he was weak. He was strong. Moses was strong. He was strong in the Lord. He allowed himself to be led by the Lord and channeled all of his effort into what the Lord wanted him to do. Servants and masters. They should be diligent, it says. Servants, hardworking, not stealing, not cheating. They're employers. Notice in Titus 2 it says that they should not be talking back, not be causing arguments. All of that defiles the gospel. If you're going to wander around as a Christian in this world, act like one. Act like one. Ephesians 6, 6 states this, not just to work hard when the employer is looking at you. Ephesians 6, 6 says this, giving people eye service. Oh, here comes the boss. Really? No, be doing the work and then when he comes around and sees you, and he knows you can't see him, that'll count ten times more than when he knows you're watching him. Just be busy. Just be doing your job. Just be diligent. That brings glory to God. You can glorify God in your work. Even the most menial task. So do we give a full eight hours of work for eight hours of pay? Are we cutting corners? Are we taking money that we really don't deserve? Doing good to your employer even when they don't do good to you. Didn't Jesus say that? Yeah, he did. His teaching applies to all parts of your life. And so it says here, you will adorn the gospel. I love this. Adorn it. Decorate it. The word in the Greek is kosmosen. It's where we get cosmetics. You're going to decorate the gospel by your life. You will adorn it. How do you want to decorate the gospel? That's my question. You're going to frame the gospel. What kind of frame are you going to use to do the gospel that saves you? Your life shows what you think of the gospel. I'll say that again. Your life shows what you think of the gospel. Self-control. Self-control is said four times in this verse here. The same word. Titus 2, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 6. Self-control, self-control, self-control. Why does it say it over and over and over? Because it's so important. Self-control is where it starts. Worldly passions are denied when we control ourselves. Worldly passions are denied when we control ourselves. The idea here is resisting passions and desires. Well, how do I do that? How do I do that? You've got to be kidding me. I can't be this self-controlled person you're talking 
what are you telling me here? This is no help at all, Dave. I can't be temperate. The good news is you will never overcome temptation on your own power, ever. But you can overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. He lives within you. When you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live within you. That's awesome. The Holy One lives within you. And we often remember the fruit of the Holy Spirit, don't we? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. And the one at the end, we kind of... There you go. Kind of forget that one, don't we? Oh yeah, self-control is a fruit of God's Spirit. Yes, love. Yes, peace. But self-control is a power that God puts in behind your back, like wind in your sails. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, Ephesians says, is available to you to live this life. He's not holding back. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. You're, you give good gifts to your children. Bread, things. You don't give stone when they ask you for food. So how much more will your Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? We can do this. By the power of God's Spirit, we can do this. We can be the church He wants us to be. Titus 2 says what we should be striving towards. We should be striving. The bride of Christ is meant to live like this before a watching world. Make no mistake, if you say you're a Christian in the workplace, there are people watching you. They are. And the Lord's going to do things and press them on their minds and hearts based on you. You might think you're doing nothing. Main point number four, the real church has pastors who are sound in teaching. This one is for me. So you can all file out the back. Titus 2.10b says, But as for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Whole, healthy teaching. What is unsound doctrine? Then? Well, it doesn't follow the scriptures. It isn't biblical. And if it isn't biblical, then it isn't sound. Some teachings based purely on philosophy may seem helpful. Oprah Winfrey's network may seem helpful. But if it's not biblical, it's not sound. Sometimes pastors, supposed pastors, I'm going to use that word supposed there, will tell you things like, God wants you rich. And they'll try and support it from Scripture. Or they'll say things like, God will always heal you. You just have to have enough faith. Hogwash. That is garbage. Always heal you, huh? You ever heard of Joni Erickson Tata? Paralyzed at the age of 17. She went on to write so many wonderful books and was a wonderful Christian lady ministering to people and Christian women around the world. She was paralyzed all her life. Really, always healed. This does not stand up to Scripture. doesn't. And sometimes we, we hear things like, God helps those who help themselves. And we hear that in a church. That is the most ridiculous, unbiblical thing I've ever heard in my life. God helps those who help themselves. That is completely antithetical to the gospel. Don't you know? In spite of our rebellion, Christ came for us. He helps those who cannot help themselves. He helps those who don't want to help themselves. He helps those who hate Him and will not have anything to do with Him. 
Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The godly for the ungodly. Does that sound like he helps you when you help yourself? That's when he helps you? No. Rightly handling the word of God is what we're looking for here. Titus 2, 1 says, and Titus 2, 7 says, sound doctrine. You should be turning to the right scripture verses and bringing them together. A pastor and an elder should have read the scripture well enough. Spurgeon said this, that you should immerse yourself in the scriptures so much as a pastor that it just comes out. You do the legwork of reading, reading, reading the scriptures. Get it into you. And the Lord brings it out. That's what, what, is, what we're looking for in a teacher. We need to be rightly handling the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says that. Rightly handling it, not badly handling it. Let me give you an example of badly handling the Word of God. Let's say you hear a teacher say, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, therefore you can hear Jesus talking audibly to you and that's how you, you know what to do. You just need to start listening hard enough. Oh, I see. Is that what he means? My sheep hear my voice? Is that what the... No, rightly handling that verse is this. We're talking about sheep and a shepherd. When he calls them, they come. They hear his voice. They know to follow the shepherd. That's all it means. It doesn't mean you should be listening intently to hear the Lord talking to you. You want to hear the Lord talk to you? Read this book out loud. I'm dead serious. Read this book out loud. In this book, it states that God talks to people when he wants to talk to people. And he doesn't, it isn't quiet. He just calls them, calls the prophets, Samuel, Samuel. That's what happens when God talks. Moses, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. When God speaks, you'll know. Okay? This is the word of God. It says that he spoke to us in the prophets in the last days, but now he's spoken to us in his son. This book is all you need to know what the Lord wants you to know. It's faith. Some people might say to you, well, we don't need the Old Testament. Is that good teaching? We don't need the Old Testament? Well, what are the, most of the scriptures that Jesus referenced from? The Old Testament. And when Paul was writing scripture, what's he quoting from? The Old Testament. How do you get these people to say, oh, I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm a red-letter Christian. I just follow what Jesus said. and say, Jesus didn't write a single thing in the Bible. It was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They recorded what they heard him say. There's a reason Jesus didn't write a book of the Bible as a human on the earth. It's so that people wouldn't get into that trap. All scripture is God-breathed. Okay? All scripture is God-breathed. It's all good from Genesis to Revelation. If you don't think, if you think for some reason that one of the books of the Bible has errors in it, I would submit to you, you don't have a very high view of God. You don't. If you think the Bible has errors, I seriously question whether you've come to know God at all. That might sound harsh. If you know the Lord and you have the fear of the Lord, then you know that he's protected this book. This was written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors. And it all ties together with one perfect common thread of salvation to the whole thing. This is an awesome book. There is no scripture written after the first century A.D. None. Because it says in Revelation at the very end, if anyone adds to this book, his name will be taken out of the, the Lamb's book of life. Read it. Revelation 22. You add anything to this book, the Lord is not happy. Do not scrub it. Do not erase. Do not bend it. Treat it with holy reverence and submit yourself underneath the word of God. And how many people do you hear talking about with the Word of God and they don't have any reverence for it? This is bad. 
The church needs to get away from this stuff that says that they can, we can do what we want. We can bend scripture. We can, eh, we can shuffle things around and we can massage things. And why do we do it? Oh, we want to make the world happy with us. We want to, oh, these people want to carry on in that behavior. Well, I guess we could, let's not talk about all those other things that you know, the scripture says. Scripture is the word of God. And you need to have a pastor and you need to have elders who understand this and committed to it. If you have come from a church that doesn't have the Bible as seeing it as inerrant or sufficient, then there's a danger there. There's a danger that you may not have heard the gospel, the real gospel. There, let, me, let me tell you something. The Bible says there are fake gospels out there. It's, in fact, it's such a horrible thing to the Lord. He says, Paul writes, you know, have nothing to do with this person. If you hear them preaching another gospel, then I brought to you. Paul was worried. That was the first century, and we've gone 2,000 years now. What isn't the gospel? Your best life now. Jesus came to make you prosperous and wonderful. He didn't come for that. That's not what it is. No, Jesus is our example. Is that the gospel? Going to the cross is an act of, of ultimate sacrifice to show us what we are supposed to do with our lives. Is that the gospel? And on the cross, yes, Jesus did conquer the kingdoms of darkness. And, and, and Colossians says that he put, made a public spectacle, spectacle of them. But that's, that's not the only reason. That's not the real reason he went to the cross. He didn't go to the cross just to secure physical healing for you. No. The gospel is this. Christ died for sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. He died for sinners. He went to the cross and suffered the wrath of God. He suffered the wrath of God in your place and mine. The cross was not some wonderful thing. It was a Roman way of executing people in a way that you and I would look at that and go, man, I never want to have that happen to me. It was horrifying. They were good at killing people, the Romans. His blood on that cross covers your sins. It's about sin and it's about forgiveness. And don't let anybody ever tell you the gospel is about any other junk. Like best life now. No. The only way to be forgiven for your sins is to turn to Jesus Christ and believe in Him by faith. Turn to Him. When you do, He'll come into your life. He will. He's there. He'll come into your life. And you will be born again. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You'll be a new creation. The old creation, the old you is not good enough. It's not. It's filled with your sin. And if you go and be with the Lord and be with his people in heaven, you're going to pollute it. You have to be changed. Turn to Christ. Receive his forgiveness and eternal life. And so, in conclusion, the real church needs to stand up today. I really feel that. The real church needs to stand up. So we see more and more flood of giving in to whatever liberal things the world wants to say to us. We give, see churches who we care about and we thought were gospel churches giving in. It needs to stand up for truth. It needs to stand up for the word of God. And it needs to be the kind of church that God says here in Titus 2. The church should be living self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. We don't need to follow the ways of the world. We don't need to impress the world. We need to reach the world with the gospel. And then the Lord will make the gospel affect them and they will join the church. We're not we're trying to we're trying to please them. Our worship service should decorate the gospel. Our lives should adorn the gospel. And that's so that the word of God is not reviled because of us. This is hard words. 
But please, let's stand up and be the real church. Amen. Thank you for listening. Uh, worship team, please come up.
So, a bit of a wow, challenging sermon. But please be encouraged. There's so much here. Are already doing that is pleasing to the Lord. But we strive on for the next thing. We see the things we're missing and we try for the next thing. The God of all comfort be with you in all of this, I pray. I want to read a passage that stood out to me um, because it was right next to part of the passages I used in the sermon. It says this in 1 Timothy 6, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. To keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen.